Very good. So who wants to um, kick the can? Fire off. Yep. Yeah. David Coddington again for Micah here. Um, Micah, it's a double bunger for you. Have you tested yellow Ceredella against Bicerilla? And um, biennial cropping, I, I believe there's a fair bit of that done in the west, where you got your pasture, hard seeded pasture one year and then uh, crop it the next. You can hear that okay? Um, yellow Ceredella, yeah, I have tried it. Um, I didn't really mention Ceredella at all, and look, I've got nothing against Ceredella. I did try French Ceredellas at first, and they do quite well in our environment. The reason I didn't go ahead and grow them, well, one reason is I had trouble harvesting them. They're supposed to be the easiest to harvest, but every time I had something to harvest, I'd get a rain and all the seed would shatter. So that sort of settled it down a bit. But the other reason I didn't go ahead with them is because sheep love Ceredella. It's the caviar of pastures. So from a weed control point of view, you didn't have those advantages that the bizarrule has got, and it was harder to maintain the weed control in the system we were running. So Ceredella is a great plant, but in my situation, I wasn't that keen on it. The yellow Ceredella, I think, has got a more of a place. Very, very tough stuff, and yeah, but just Bizarrule is so hard to beat that you need a good reason to grow it. Uh, second part of the question, I think you were talking about the one-to-one -one pasture cropping in Western Australia, is that right? Yeah, the West Australians are pretty keen on that idea. They, because of the hard seed of these things, you can crop one year and then the seed from the year before will come up the following year. So we'll have a crop, pasture crop. I just found that they're, they're a slightly different environment to us and look, if they can control the weeds in that system, then that's a pretty good system, I think. But in our system where the rainfall spread throughout the year and we can uh, capitalise on coming out of pasture with a short fallow into canola, that's got advantages for us. And I, I just, the weed control in a one-to-one -one pasture cropping situation for me looked a bit too difficult. I'm not saying if you can manage it, it might be okay, but um, yeah, it just didn't seem the thing for me to do. So I hope that helps a bit. Uh, Gordon Dan McDonald here from Gundagai. Uh, all the um, the research on the um, on grazing cereals seems to be um, has revolved around wheat. Can you comment on grazing barley and oats for us, please, as far as mineral supplementation goes? Uh, yeah, so the, um, the relationships are still very much the same, a, a little similar, the same, if you know what I mean. Um, so the wheat has the K&A gene that controls the low uptake of sodium specifically, and that'll go across into the hybrid with triticale. It's not so strong in oats or in barley, so the sodium content and the riskiness of those cereals uh, isn't as great, but when you look at the feed ratios, uh, things like the dietary cation anion difference, the ratio of potassium to sodium plus magnesium, they're still above the indicator uh, thresholds. So they're still risky feeds. There's more salt in oats uh, and uh, less in barley, but less in triticale and less again in wheat. So there's a, a rank, but you still need the mineral supplements. So there's definite benefits in, in supplementing grazing on, um, uh, supplementing with those minerals grazing on, on your oats and your barley? Yeah, I'd still do that. So, yes, I would. And um, what about um, just adding mineral um, salt when you're grazing on um, loosened only pastures? That's correct, just salt. Thank you. Uh, I had a quick question for Sue, wondering if the tropical grasses ever sort of add that leaf litter or increase the ground cover by the time we've got through to the end of the summer, so what impact they have on our soil surface. And then a question for Gordon, with uh, adding the salt, can we ever overdo it? Uh, so Lisa, you were asking 
whether there whether there is improved ground cover by the end of summer. Is, was that your question? Um, yeah. So we we find um, because they don't tend to be grazed, um, you know, super short, um, that we end up with a lot of leaf litter on the ground. Um, so the plants themselves become quite large over time, and then we've got leaf litter covering the surface um, elsewhere. Uh, so the question, the question around um, how much salt, or is there too much salt? Um, so I probably could have added a bit more value to the last question as well, and these two butt together a little bit. Some of the growth rate responses that are in the literature and some recent work with Sean McGrath and Matthew Champness here at CSU shows that by providing salt uh, for animals on loosen, it can increase growth rates anywhere from none and up to 60%. So on average, you're still budgeting around about 20%. In Matthew's work, uh, in the first year, it was fairly droughty and the loosen was senescing and drying out a little bit. The growth rates were quite low uh, and the sheep tended to eat a lot of salt. They were eating 30, 40, 50 grams a day high intakes, high average intakes uh, over the trial period. When the loosen was bouncing away nice and fresh in the second year of the study, uh, they got much improved growth rates as well, but you're still probably budgeting around 20 to 30 grams of salt when you have, have it out there, just to give them the choice. They may only need 10. Oh, hi, John Forster, uh, Chairman Valley. Um, I've got uh, the Chimmet River running alongside my boundary and I get a really high water table uh, during summertime. So this is uh, tropical pastures and uh, I get a fair swathe of uh, paspalum coming across my place. With that high water table, will the tropical pasture, Sue, uh, benefit from that high water table in this situation, do you think? Uh, what, what depth is your, does the, is, what depth is the water table? Oh, sometimes only about uh, two metres. So it, it, in the middle of summer when they're pumping the water down to the MIA, the, the river's pumping at about 9,000 megs a day down the Tumut River, it's just a, just a big channel. But uh, sometimes closer to the river, it's only, only about two metres. As you get further away, it drops a bit. But uh, yeah, but the past parliament at the moment's a metre and a half high. Loving it. Um, so would it access it? Um, look, if it's got, if it can access water and nitrate at depth, it will, it will tap into it. And while it may not, um, we've had um, water extraction close to two metres, um, but it, it hasn't done that year in, year out, basically because we've run out of soil moisture at depth. But in your case, that won't, that doesn't appear to be a problem. So yeah, I think it could, it could certainly access that. Um, I don't think you'd have problems with persistence with waterlogging in that situation. Um, yeah, I think paspalum, if you're growing paspalum, then that's probably a pretty good, pretty good indication. And can you then sow, uh, under sow or over sow in a wet year, say like we've had a, a couple of decent rainfalls in January, February this year, uh, with these tropical grasses, can they be sown in, into a moisture profile in the summertime? to uh, use that soil moisture in that situation in our, in our summer, because you know, we're down in southern. Yeah, so the stored soil moisture is actually really, really important. So we've done some work at Trangy where we had a look at the, the, the importance of that stored soil moisture. And um, they found that um, just coming up on, on rainfall, they would emerge on rainfall. Um, spring and autumn in the Trangy environment was where we actually had the best, the best establishment. I'm sorry, the best emergence, but that long-term establishment was, um, was much greater where we had stored soil moisture. So yes, so um, having that stored soil moisture is really important. The, you will actually, our recommendation is because they need to be sown shallow, it's best to sow them probably dry and then wait for the rainfall to bring them up. Um, Hannah Messner from Tulimba, and I've got a question for you, Sue. Um, just wondering what animal health issues you can get with tropical grasses. Yeah, good question. It varies with the species. Um, so yeah, look, so paspalum, can, you can have some issues. Uh, probably a species that we've had some issues with in the, um, in the north over the last few years is, is pure stands of Bambatsi panic. Um, now Mike was talking about um, photosynthesisation. You can actually get that from um, through um, 
Ben Batsy panic as well. It can cause some issues. Uh, so um, when it comes to, to Ben Batsy panic, it's not a species we would recommend that you actually sow as a pure stand. You sow it as a mixture. Um, so yeah, look, there are, there are some other issues. And like all species, um, if there's any vets here, they will tell you that any species can, you know, can be toxic at different times. Um, but having said that, um, you know, things like um, Premier Digit Grass, I know I keep mentioning Premier Digit, it, it is a bit of a favourite of mine, um, but we haven't, um, yeah, we're certainly not having um, issues with, um, with stock losses or any health issues. Uh, Stephen Scott from Henty. I'm a mixed farmer, cropping and livestock. Um, when I put my cropping hat on and go and do summer spraying to uh, conserve moisture to, to chase water use efficiency, am I painting myself into a corner knowing that, um, as the, the graphs and slides showed earlier, the, when the, you have your wet summers with warm conditions, you're going to get an abundance of root growth. Knowing that organic matter and soil carbon lead to increased water use efficiencies, am I painting myself into a corner by chasing water use efficiency premiums in my cropping program? And can I offset that in my um, cropping program by having multi-species crops? I'll have a, go. I'll have a go. Um, <laughs> I would have, yeah, no, I, I wouldn't think so. In, step one for me is water would be my number one nutrient I would be after. You, you won't get much without it. Um, but it, definitely you can increase the amount of organic carbon in there um, by increasing root matter, which is just a function of top matter, and top matter usually means more saleable product. So that's a good one. Um, the multi species thing, if if, you, if you're talking about the whole regenerative ag movement or just multi-species in general, I've done that much reading and it's about 90% not in favour of multi-species um, versus 10 in favour of multi-species on one parameter and that was a bit of early dry matter accumulation post uh, germination. So my answer to that would be no, um, that won't matter because a multi-species or a single species will bump up against the same limitation just as quickly generally. Um, deep mining of nutrients, I, I don't believe there's many down there actually. Um, with regards to that, we've had some questions about the multi-species thing as well and realise it's um, a pretty hot topic and plenty of people are trying it. Um, we've actually got a project which is due to start soon. Um, there'll be sites in southern New South Wales, right through to northern New South Wales, looking at some of this. So yeah, watch this space. Um, go on the Wisconsin University website under their sustainable agriculture um, site and there's heaps of really good stuff. And John Francis did a rebuttal from an economic perspective, which is also Excellent reading. Uh, Sue, Neil Durning, local agronomist here in Wagga. Um, just a question about the Premier Digit and we talked, talked a fair bit about biomass accumulation. Did you want to comment on energy and how that changes throughout crop or throughout pasture height and what, at what heights we should be managing that so that animals don't go backwards? Yeah, really good question, Neil. Um, the, so that some of the original work we were doing was actually looking at, um, we weren't grazing, we were, we were defoliating. We were using our lawnmowers to graze. Um, we're looking at two and six week rotation. Um, so I don't know that, um, and we found that certainly by keeping it short and green, and they are a species that respond to being kept short and green, and that's where the quality is maximum. Uh, Basil spoke in his um, presentation about leaf number. So we've been doing some work on that and the optimum for, um, well, we, we were looking at silage production as well, but the short, when it's short and green, that's when you've got your maximum production. Once it starts going into steam elongation, that's when your quality drops. Does that answer your question? I'll just add a little bit. We're um, doing some work with Ceteria and Brachiaria in the wet tropics. And a lot of the research there says, leave it to 50 centimetres and just nip the top off it. And I think a lot of the research is potentially prejudiced by the belief that you can't impact on elongation. So it will either elongate um, because it wants to go to seed or because it's self-shading. 
So a plant, once it starts to shade leaves, will send some more stem up to get the next one up above the canopy. Um, and we're, we're having really good success at the right leaf stages in minimising elongation. And there's no change in NDF up to the plant starts to elongate. So you can maintain that high quality up to whatever the leaf number is for the plant. Daryl Kiddo here from West Wyong Art Bethan District. Um, just regarding some of these tropicals, we do have a, a bit of a beast of a plant down here of Feathertop Road. That's a real problem in cropping. Does any of these tropicals possess that same roundup resistance to be a problem in the cropping side of the system? And secondly, just how far south will buffalo grow? <laughs> um. I actually am not particularly fond of buffalo. Um, I've, um, yeah, I, I know Queenslanders love it, and I'm sorry if there's any Queenslanders here, but the, um, I've, yeah, look, I think I think we have better species, high quality, <coughs> excuse me, high quality species, and if we can do that, then I think we should. The same as up north, some people rave about um, console love grass. Now, while it's not recommended in, in all areas down here anyway. That um, um, again, it's it's a great species in in the right place. But if you've got something better, you might as well use it. Now, um, the literature, some so some early work that was done, you know, decades ago, um, they actually found that the further south you came, buffalo actually wasn't effective um, because it couldn't handle the cold. Any other species potential to become roundup resistant? Oh, are there any other species potential to become roundup resistant? Um, not that I'm aware of. I haven't actually done any work in that, so I can't. I can't really give that question. Yeah, good. Yeah, good answer to that one. But none that come to mind. None of the perennials that we've um, that we've been working with have shown to be um, yeah in anything like that um, as far as Roundup resistance or anything. We can we can take them out if necessary. I was just asking a question about whether how hard it is to establish some of those plants actually provide some security in that space. Um, I think establishing tropical pasture is going to be something we need to um, we need some more research to understand um, because that prior planning and preparation I think is probably one of the the main reasons for establishment failure. Or well, yeah, so if. There's been a lot of development over many decades of the, the temperate grasses. So they've been selected for vigour um, and you know, they're big, robust seedlings. I, I know when you actually compare them compared to an annual, they don't seem to be very, very robust at times. But compared to a tropical, the temperates are actually a lot more robust. So it means that that prior planning and preparation is really, really, really important. And I've forgotten the question. Ah, uh, whether that how hard that is to do buffers you against them uh, becoming a weed. Yes, yeah, so once you've actually got them established, get, having any other, I'm not answering Basil Spouse's question, but anyway, I'll keep talking. The, um, <laughs> who was it that was saying they can talk, talk all day? I think it was Gordy. Um, the, so once you've actually got a tropical established, if you maintain fertility, it's got good ground cover. We've actually found them to be extremely effective um, in controlling weeds. So that's some of those, those difficult weeds. Um, or we have um, spiny burr grass, um, heliotrope. Um, if you've got African love grass, it's actually good at keeping that out as well, where you've got a productive and persistent stand. Um, so it can be effective against weed control for things like that. Um, some of the species will regenerate from seedlings. Um, Premier Digit, for example, it will, it will regenerate from seed that's set the previous year. Not all species do that, do that well, um, but that is one, so stands do thicken. Yeah, pretty excited about tropicals. Hi. Uh, with last year's um, cereal growth being massive, uh, I'm a bit close. Um, I'm not real keen on burning paddocks to reduce the, the organic matter. Is there another way, because our direct drill won't go through and it's there, is there a, a 
a economical way to break that down without working it in. Does anyone else want to answer that? Do you want to have a go? Basil? Oh, unless you've got animals that you're prepared to take weight off. Okay, then no. Spread, spread some Bizarilla in it. Just graze it. <laughs> uh, Mike, thanks for your great presentation. I'm looking at the winter growth. Obviously, you've got tons of green feed in winter and spring with the Bizarilla and clovers. Uh, stubbles obviously make up the sheep component for grazing through summer. What's the gap in autumn and how do you fill it? Yeah, we have gaps at various times at Beckham, actually. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes. Um, yeah, I think I know what you're getting at. Like, uh, annual legume pastures don't fill the whole feed gap, right? Um, in a average sort of summer, Bizarula in particular is unbelievable as dry summer feed. Once lambs get to about 35 kilos or something, and certainly adult sheep, they just, I've seen them become obese on it, like over summer on the dry feed, because they're picking up some of the reasonable quality dry feed, but there's a lot of high protein in the seed they're getting, because they're aerial seeders, they're picking up a lot of the seed. Um, yeah, gen generally, well, another advantage of these, because they do better, well, particularly the Bizarula does better in the autumn, It'll survive those false breaks. We often get a bit more feed in the autumn. We can, you get an autumn break, well, that could be any time at Beckham, but um, sometimes you get a break, might be a bit late, say, end of April or something, even into May. What we often do, we put the sheep on the Bizarula paddocks because they can't flog it out. It just lays low, sits on the ground. Let the other paddocks get away a bit or we might have some uh, grazing cereal or something. So put them on there. Uh, sorry, put them on the Bizarula while the other's getting away. And then when you take the sheep off the Bizarula, instead of a clover paddock that might be flogged out and you've done a lot of damage to it, sure you've delayed it, but it'll, it'll just come away. It can, can handle that situation. So they're not the answer to everything. But because of the toughness and the flexibility, they, they answer a few questions. But, that, but that's why uh, you need a bit of loosen or something. Like in the last summer where we've had a bit of rain, of course the quality of the dry feed hasn't been that brilliant on, on these pastures. So, you know, we've got our share of heliotrope and goosefoot and what have you, but I mean that's got, just got to go because it's just no good for anything. So you've got an issue there. So that's where uh, a bit of loosen can come in handy. And uh, Sue keeps talking to us, you know, maybe a bit of tropical grass or something. So the annual pasture system definitely isn't the answer to everything, but um, it answers a few questions and it works pretty well with the cropping rotation. Yeah. No, thanks, Mike. Um, Jeff, one more question. <laughs> Gordy. Um, just expand, Could you, is there anything else required? Um, lime, salt, cause mag, that's the brew used widely. Is there anything else needed in those brews? I'll add energy into the system as well and water and all that, but is there anything else needed in the, um, the supplement? On a grazing cereal? On a, on a grazing cereal or a canola. Okay, it's a great question, Jim. Uh, for grazing cereals, no, not in my view. There's nothing else that stands out. I guess in many ways we're governed by what happens on farm and you get the feedback from there and anecdotes and they accumulate and you start to look at these things. And one of the things that drew everybody's attention to the requirement for minerals on grazing cereals, particularly lime, cause, mag and salt, was the death of sheep, particularly twin bearing ewes. But when you ask other questions, there's bone disorders as well, which are still implicated with calcium management. So the standard mix is the recommendation. Nothing else is standing out there. The grazing brassicas and the canolas are different, which is interesting because their mineral profile, whilst fairly similar, suggesting that there could be some problems, there's 
there's not a lot of reports around milk fever or grass tetany uh, or bone disorders in these animals on, those, uh, on that forage base. The trial work, the only trial work that's around that I'm aware of that's been published talks about uh, the, the benefit of providing supplements on a canola uh, showed there was no improvement in growth rate in one year or, or a reduction in growth rate by providing salt and cause mag. So the advice has to be that's either a waste of money or it's holding you back. So at the moment, the advice is there's no supplement required for the canolas or the brassicas, notwithstanding the issues around nitrate poisoning and management of animals and photosensitivity and some other things that pop up occasionally. Uh, so that's the advice at the moment. You still, if you, if you follow Twitter, you'll see recommendations saying, yes, put the cause mag and lime uh, and salt out, um, but there's no evidence published to support that. And maybe some of the differences might actually be around soil mineral content, soil fertility. Maybe that's one of the variables, but it hasn't been looked at. And the only literature says it's a waste of money. Iodine uh, in uh, brassicas, canolas on iodine deficient soils uh, or iodine marginal soils in wet years. So iodine and selenium in wet years is soluble and they'll move out of the profile and you'll start to see these reproductive disorders like uh, goiter in sheep, that's the swollen glands around the neck of the newborn lamb, uh, or the wool will start to fall out of the sheep or you just have a lot of dead animals or low fertility, white muscle disease in the lambs. So selenium and iodine in wet years, but iodine can be a problem on iodine deficient soils in the canolas and brassicas. Uh, Jamie Urquhart um, from Urana. Uh, just one for Mike. Uh, have you thought or tried um, old hard seeded Batch varieties to mix to uh, regenerate in the same sort of system. Yeah, that's precisely why I don't grow veg, um, because it's hard seeded. I, I can't remember the variety, but there's an old um, batch I yeah, grew once and had hard seed and gave that up, and then um, a new one came out, Marava, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Thought, ah, oh, this is good, it's soft seeded. So I grew it one year, harvested some seed, and of course left some behind. We grew wheat the following year, and I, from memory, I think took it out with lontrel out of the wheat or something, and thought, oh yeah, we'll be right. Well, the next year we had uh, lupins in the paddock. We grew up, grew up through the lupins, so if that was soft seeded, I'm not sure what happened. but. Yeah, if you can fit that into your system and manage the um, problems with contaminating wheat, because I think there's a nil tolerance in wheat, isn't there? Um, yeah, fine, I mean, but no, I decided that one was for the too hard basket. But vetch is a very adaptable plant and certainly does well in our environment. Any more questions? We're coming, coming to the end. I think we're slowing down. <laughs> Very good. Rightio. If we could um, just thank all of our speakers and our in the panel, please. <laughs> Enough hands. Thank you, Mike your time today. We really appreciate your input. And, and Basil, thank you very much. I really enjoyed your talk. And to the guys from the DPI, thanks so much for your, your work and your, um, your input for the last two days. It's, we really appreciate it. It's been great. Um, and that's going to wrap up today's proceedings. Um, if you can all make sure you fill out those evaluation forms. I know I harp on that a bit, but it really is important to us. Um, thank you all for spending the time with us today and um, showing, or probably showing to us that this, these sort of events are of value and that there is a, a need for us to put more of these events on in terms of focusing on pastures and those sorts of things. Um, be, um, be honest in your evaluation, good, bad or indifferent. Um, and remember to just put your contact de details on the back of that sheet. Um, if you want to hear more, inf more information or communications from us, 
so that we can just keep you in the loop of what we've got going on around the, the districts. Um, this, this conference from mine is probably going to preempt us doing some more work for the DPI, hopefully across the region. Um, the pastures walk tomorrow, I'll probably be there out at Gorgawi. Um, Martin will be there also, but we are looking to work on some more projects that um, can focus on some of the work that we showed today and then um, some newer ideas that we've got coming out of um, some of that work that's already going. So hopefully we um, are going to build a bit of a partnership across our region and can do a bit more together. So um, anyway, that's all from us and thank you very much. Oh yes, sorry, I did forget that. Um, so today's event was recorded, um, and those uh, the, the the presentations and all of that will go on our website uh, hopefully in the next few weeks. So if you've got people you know that may be interested in things that were shown today, make sure you let them know. Um, we will advertise when that's available. Um, the other the other thank you I did probably miss was um, a thank you to Martin who has carried the can on these events um, for quite some time and has done a great job doing all the intricate bits um, and while I was swanning around in Queensland the last two weeks he sort of um, got it sorted so um, thank, you. thank you Martin. Anyway I uh, hope you've enjoyed today and um, safe travel home.